Welcome everyone. Um, I think we can get started. I'm just going to um, do some introductions and then turn it over to Dr. Stadnik. So good afternoon and welcome to the Implementation Science Seminar sponsored by the Columbia University Irving Institute CTSA and the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Uh, my name is Sapana Patel and with co-leaders Dr. Rachel Shelton and Dr. Natalie Moise, we are excited to have Dr. Nicole Stadnik join us to present on strategies for meaningful community engagement in rapid response implementation research. Dr. Stadnik is a licensed psychologist and assistant professor of psychiatry and director of the dissemination and evaluation at the University of California at San Diego and the Altman Clinical and Translational Research Institute. Her program of federally, state, and privately funded research focuses on evaluating the implementation and sustainment of evidence-based practices in community-based health or mental health service contexts. Before I turn it over to Dr. Stadnik, I just want to remind everyone that today's presentation will be recorded. And it's great to see such a big group join for Dr. Stadnik's presentation. And as such, we're going to um, mute everybody's lines until the end when we have a Q&A. But you can feel free to en enter any questions that you all might have in the chat. Um, and with that, we're thrilled to have you, Nicole, and I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Sapana and Rachel and Dora. It's so nice to, to be with you all this afternoon. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen. And I tested this before. I think it works. Hopefully you see a big screen with a slide on it. Um, I, again, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you, Sapana. Thrilled to be here with you today. Um, and thank you for the comment about the, the view behind me. Um, if you're able to join us for the Society uh, for Implementation Research Collaboration CERT conference in September, this could also be your view. In, um, so hope, hope to see and meet many of you um, at that conference. So um, today um, I'll talk about two specific um, implementation research projects that we launched um, within the past two years in the context of COVID. And I, I wanna highlight a few um, community engagement methods that we found really successful and enriching to, to our research um, projects. And I do wanna acknowledge um, our two community partners that are on this slide, the Global Action Research Center and San Ysidro Health, which is a federally qualified health center um, serving um, many underserved communities near the US-Mexico border. I'll talk more about them in just a minute. So um, Sapana provided a really nice introduction um, to me and my background. Just to give a few more details so you all know where I'm coming from, uh, my background in formal training is um, in clinical psychology, and I'm a licensed psychologist. Um, I also have a master's in public health um, focused on epidemiology. I, in um, the past couple of years, I have been focusing more and more on health services and implementation um, science research, did a postdoc at UCSB, um, working with Greg Ahrens and Lauren brooklyn Frizzi, continue to collaborate with them, I'm two wonderful people. And um, now I'm uh, an assistant professor and um, DISC co-director. DISC is our DNI Science Center here at UC San Diego. And I'll share a little bit more about um, our science, DNI Science Center at the very end of my presentation in case you're all interested in some of our upcoming activities. Um, I also have some specialized um, training through uh, two NIH-funded fellowships, um, the Johns Hopkins um, Mixed Methods Research Training Program for Health Sciences and the NIH and VA funded Implementation Research Institute Fellowship to your really amazing experiences. Um, if you have the opportunity to apply, highly encourage you to do so. And um, I've been fortunate to work um, across a number of different um, service contexts and health conditions, applying implementation science to those. Um, I have just a couple of examples um, of projects listed below. I'll mostly be focusing on the co-create and stop COVID-19 California projects that you see on the right-hand screen. Okay. Uh, 
To start, um, I want to acknowledge both the people and the funders of these two projects that I'll be uh, discussing with you today. Um, as you can see on this slide, um, both projects take a huge um, amount of um, effort from um, people, um, including you know, our researchers, our community partners, um, research staff, um, undergraduate interns. Um, both of these projects were funded by um, really unique and special mechanisms from um, the National Institutes of Health. Um, some of you may um, have funding from these two mechanisms as well. Um, our Stop COVID-19 California project was funded by um, a um, community engagement alliance mechanism. And then our co-create project was funded by a rapid acceleration um, for diagnostics for underserved populations mechanism. So in, in my presentation today, um, I'd like to highlight a few types of engagement methods that we've used in both of those projects. Um, these methods are by no means um, the only methods. Um, and and I'm, in fact, I'm hoping that we can have a bit of a conversation via chat and then um, during the Q&A portion about other community engagement methods that you've used or you've been considering using in your own work. So I'll um, talk a bit about community-led methods, including um, developing a theory of change and using an appreciative inquiry um, uh, evaluation method. I'll also talk about participatory methods, including um, community advisory boards, um, brain writing, and um, mixed methods needs assessments. And then finally, I'll talk um, a bit about evaluation or measurement um, engagement methods. Um, including a partner engagement um, survey method that we've used, ethnographic methods, and I think if there's time, um, a pragmatic resource tracking of engagement activities. Um, and again, there's many more. Um, these are just a, a sampling of some of the methods that we've used. Um, and in fact, I am going to pose a question to you all in the chat. Um, what methods for community engagement have you used? And I'm going to open up my chat box so I can make sure to see. Feel free to just type it in the chat. Um, I'd, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you through some of the, the methods that you've used in your work. Okay, great focus groups. Community studios, advisory boards, co-creation of frameworks, community coalition meetings, excellent. Engaging with key stakeholders in the community. Stakeholder meetings. Great, well, I appreciate um, those, those comments. I, again, hoping to talk more with you about um, how you use these methods, how they've worked, you know, opportunities and challenges in working um, and using some of these methods. So thank you so much. Okay, so um, I'd like to provide a, a little bit of background in both of these projects and then I'll get more focused on the different methods, um, engagement methods um, that I, I shared with you about. So this first project, um, the uh, Stop COVID-19 California Alliance, um, it is, um, one statewide collaborative um, that is funded, again, through the NIH Community Engagement Alliance. So um, the statewide collaborative, um, the goal of it is to reduce misinformation, um, increase diversity and accessibility of vaccine clinical trials, and promote vaccine uptake in um, the most effective, uh, affected and, and underserved communities um, in California. Across the state, we had um, 11 academic institutions um, plus 70, over 70 local community organizations partner with those academic institutions. So um, myself and my, um, my close colleague, Borsha Kawabin, we co-led the UC San Diego um, academic site in partnership with our community partner, the Global Action Research Center. And I will say, although the uh, initial focus was really on increasing um, diversity and participation in uh, clinical trials, it quickly became apparent from our um, community advisory boards 
that there was a, a much more um, pressing need to focus on, um, you know, vaccine um, attitudes, information, access, and so we focused our project mostly on those needs. The second project um, that I'll uh, share with you about is um, our co-create project. And um, this is, again, funded by a rapid acceleration of diagnostics for underserved populations um, grant mechanism. This was a phase one study, and we actually just applied on Monday for a phase three um, application to continue this funding. Um, this project, the, the goal of it really was to co-create, as the acronym um, suggests, um, a community-driven COVID-19 testing program um, centered in a federally qualified health center um, in San Ysidro um, near the U.S.-Mexico border. And so this is actually a photo um, at, the, at the federally qualified health center um, with two of our um, active participants um, who um, enjoyed coming to the testing um, program and gave us a lot of really important feedback about how to tailor it for um, their community's needs. So one of our um, foundational engagement methods across both projects um, was establishing and convening a community advisory board. So the photos here um, show our two uh, community advisory boards for each project. We had a project specific advisory board for each because the aims um, and the communities who we were uh, trying to engage were slightly different. Um, so in the top, uh, top portion, the top photo, um, this is a photo of our advisory board for the Stop COVID-19 um, project, which was really focused on engaging um, immigrant and refugee communities in San Diego. Um, and then the, the bottom photo um, includes our community and scientific advisory board, which again was focused on a COVID-19 testing program, um, primarily for um, underserved um, Latino communities near the US-Mexico border. Um, so we met over, um, I think it's actually closer to probably 25 times for the past 18 months. We met um, about weekly um, over Zoom, um, and we used a few other um, kind of technology um, tools to enhance engagement in our advisory board meetings. So we used something called um, Miro, or Miro, um, which I'll sh I think I have a photo of, of it um, in a moment but it's a sort of virtual sticky board where you can write notes on kind of post-it notes and then move them around. And we use that to facilitate uh, co-development of our theories of change for each project. We also used uh, breakout rooms and both of these community advisory board meetings included um, community members um, whose primary or preferred language was Spanish. So we did have concurrent um, uh, Spanish translation and interpretation happening in both of these meetings. So a couple of um, sort of important lessons that we learned in, in um, conducting these advisory board meetings, which I need to um, explain that these were both facilitated by our community partner, the Global Action Research Center. Um, Paul Watson and Bill Oswald are the uh, directors of that um, uh, nonprofit organization, which um, before we engaged with them, they were really focused on um, issues of environmental justice and um, kind of other less, less focused on kind of public health priorities. Um, but they had a longstanding relationship with the university and um, they're very, very well respected um, in the community and with policymakers. Um, and so it was sort of a natural extension of their work and we were really delighted to be able to partner with them. Um, so a few lessons learned um, from our, our work in um, conducting these advisory board meetings. Um, some of these lessons learned probably resonate with you all. Um, we needed to translate all of our materials um, into Spanish, including our written um, materials you know, on our slides, as well as to have you know, live interpretation as we went. We needed to speak slowly uh, for interpretation, which is something that I still struggle with. And um, our community partners and our interpreter often remind us very gently um, to do. We also needed to be mindful of ongoing technical assistance um, to our um, community members and advisory board members. This included um, purchasing and helping them set up um, Chromebooks, hotspots, 
um, you know, installing Zoom on their computers, um, and, and that sort of continued throughout the projects. We found that the um, kind of late afternoon, early evening time worked really well, and we had really phenomenal attendance um, across our you know, 25 or so meetings um, at that time. Um, we also um, found it really helpful to have um, scribes in our breakout room. Um, so I was a scribe um, in many of the breakout, breakout rooms where I would you know, take notes so that everyone could see. And I wouldn't necessarily provide my own opinion, um, similar to you know, what you might do in a, um, as a facilitator of you know, a qualitative interview or, or a focus group. But I, um, the scribes would sort of reflect what the breakout room was saying and just ensure that they had um, kind of captured the, um, the important information that, that the um, breakout rooms were trying to convey. Uh, we also tried to kind of finish up the um, specific advisory board activities about 10 minutes before the end of the meeting um, so that we could go around and ask each of the advisory board members um, what, what's something that you'll take away from this meeting or what's something that you'll continue to think about until we next meet? And we found that a really rich way for people to connect and to really just kind of take a step back and think about what work we had accomplished um, in that meeting. And then last but certainly not least, um, we compensated all of our um, advisory board members. Um, we were able to provide $100 per meeting. Um, and that was really, you know, we really wanted to be um, uh, mindful of the expertise and time that uh, they were contributing. And this was sort of a small way for us to acknowledge that. Okay. Oh, and I'm seeing a question here. Was my wire translated in real time? Yes, it was. Um, so we had, mostly this was, in, we would have a breakout room with a Spanish interpreter and then the um, community members who um, spoke Spanish. So they, um, they wrote, would write their notes in Spanish and then the um, interpreter would translate for us once we came back into a larger group. So this slide here shows you the composition of our advisory boards. Um, again, we, we um, had different, a different composition of members based on the project and the project um, goals. So for our co-create project, it was quite a large advisory board. Um, we had 22 members. Nine um, were community partners, um, primarily community health workers or promotoras. We also included um, public health research partners. Um, these were experts in you know, either infectious disease, community engagement, um, implementation science. And then we had seven clinic partners um, who were either providers or higher level administrators at that federally qualified health center. And then on the, um, for the Stop COVID-19 project, again, this was focused really on engaging um, immigrant and refugee communities. So we had um, 11 community leaders um, from um, different ethnically based and community based organizations. Um, and then we also included two um, city council policy partners. They were non-voting members, um, but they nonetheless were really engaged in helping us think through what, you know, what were some of the San Diego um, council priorities and resources to be able to um, kind of think through um, what could we do to address kind of COVID-19 testing and vaccination access. So I want to um, ask you all a question, and again, if you can share in the chat, um, who were some of your partners in, in research? Or in practice, I'm now recognizing that we may have, you know, um, a group here who identifies as both, you know, a researcher and or a practitioner. Um, so please, please do share. Who are some of your partners in your work? individuals with lived experience, policymakers, providers, cancer survivors, um, CHWs, lay health advisors, local government, CHWs, non-specialist providers, former patients, parents and teachers. Oh, hello, Ghazi, nice to have you here. CBOs, local government, lay health workers, people with lived experience.
Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing about that. Definitely important to have um, um, individuals who um, I think have some lived experience either professionally or personally. Um, so it's great to see the, the different multi-level and diverse um, partners who you're working with. Okay, so our next, um, the next method that I want to share a bit about um, that was, again, really driven by and co-produced with our two advisory boards um, is a theory of change. Um, this, some of you may be familiar with this. Um, it's um, what we like to describe it as a logic model on steroids. So it's really a comprehensive illustration of how and why a desired change is expected to happen um, in a particular setting. And so on the left-hand side, we have, I have an example of a generic theory of change. Um, and then on the, the right-hand side, this is what one of our theories of change um, look like. I believe this is, um, this is from our co-create project. So you can see at the very top, we have our North Star, um, which was to, um, eliminate disparities experienced by underserved communities in testing, access to treatment, and ultimately in mortality and morbidity from COVID-19. And then from that goal, um, in each of our subsequent advisory board meetings, we worked on a section of this theory of change. So we tried to understand, well, what were some of the contributing um, factors to those um, COVID-19 disparities? what were necessary conditions to address and eliminate disparities, and then what are the actions and measures of success needed um, so that we can make those necessary conditions a reality. So that's really what we worked on with our advisory board. And I'm going to, sh I'm going to break it down and give you a few more examples of concretely what a session looked like. So this is from a slide um, from one of our advisory board meetings. And so, um, the goal of this particular meeting, um, I believe it was, put all these up here. Um, I think this was closer to um, maybe one of our middle um, sessions. Um, the goal was to identify factors that may contribute to disparities in access to vaccinations and participation in clinical trials to test the vaccines. Um, again, this was part of our Stop COVID-19 project um, where we were engaging um, in immigrant and refugee communities. So we explained that the first step was we would present a focus question. Um, everyone would individually take a few minutes to think of their own responses. We would break um, the, the um, larger group up into smaller groups. We only had um, 13 people in this advisory board, so we just divided them into two. They shared their individual responses um, facilitated by a scribe who wrote down their responses onto these sticky notes using the Miro platform. The facilitator, which um, was either um, Paul Watson or Bill Oswald, our community partners at the Global Action Research Center, they would call everyone back together and um, sort the responses. Um, again, we would share our screen showing the Miro sticky notes. So we would sort those individual uh, kind of sticky note responses into themes. Um, constantly asking the advisory board, you know, does this make sense? The way that we're sorting this, does this sound, does this sound right to you? Is this kind of a cohesive summary of your um, experiences and reflections? And then once we had sorted the different um, responses, um, then we asked the group to, to name um, those, those groupings, um, trying to be concise but descriptive, which was always a balance, kind of a difficult balance to make. Let me see. So um, this is an example of um, what um, kind of continuing with the example of how we um, produced our necessary conditions to eliminate disparities in vaccine access. So this was the focus question that we posed. Um, what conditions need to exist to eliminate disparities in vaccinations and participation in clinical trials? And through you know, a two-hour session working with our advisory board, um, these were the top, um, not, not actually top, these were all of the necessary conditions um, that they came up with. So these were after we had the individual responses, we sorted them and then came up with names to describe each of the, um, the themes. So for example, um, a necessary condition um, would be to have a healthcare system 
that was focused on COVID-19, but also accessible uh, for all. Um, a second necessary condition was to have a social safety net or services for immigrant and refugee population, populations. Um, and then another example is to have you know, access to trusted, truthful um, information from government sources. And again, we did this process um, both for both projects. Um, and I think I'll show you in just a moment, um, there was a lot of overlap in the, um, in the themes across the different components of the theory of change. This is another example of um, how we uh, co-produced the necessary actions needed to facilitate those conditions. Um, th so this is an example of um, the Miro sticky board um, that we used and we would sort them. Um, so for example, the access to trusted truthful information from government sources, the individual responses that comprised that um, action um, was you know, more leadership and engagement by elected officials, um, community meetings to hear from every community, providing access to reliable information from multiple sources that give consistent messages um, that address people's fears and informs them on how vaccines work. So this is just an example of how we sorted and then named um, the different components. This was our final theory of change um, for the CoCreate project. I, I showed it to you a couple of slides before, but just so you can see it in slightly larger um, uh, font. Um, we, we fought really hard to be able to include the, um, the CAB produced, the Community Advisory Board produced theories of change in our publication, um, because we thought it was really important to, um, to show the, the exact words um, that our advisory board members um, came up with. And um, so again, you can see um, the goal that we had um, initially established, um, and then we worked on creating the, you know, thinking through the necessary conditions, actions, and measures of success to reach that goal. This is from, this is from our theory of change uh, manuscript. Um, we have a figure here that sort of synthesizes the theory to change across those two projects. And we found common themes related to language and cultural barriers, um, information and communication barriers and distrust, access barriers, and socioeconomic barriers. And then underneath that, we mapped on, um, again, the necessary conditions, actions, um, and measures of success um, to address those common thematic barriers. So um, if, you, if you'd like more information about how we um, co-created these theories of change and some of the results, um, this is our paper um, that was published in Health Services Research um, just a few months ago. Okay, I want to be mindful of the time. I think I have another 20 or so minutes and then I will make sure to, to pause and take 10 minutes for, for Q&A. So the next method that I want to um, tell you, um, share with you about is um, this brain writing pre-mortem um, exercise. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of it. It was relatively new to me before we uh, decided to use it. Um, we borrowed it from, um, I think, the, the marketing field um, or maybe engineering field. And it has kind of a human-centered, user-centered design focus. Um, the idea um, is that you would, you know, present sort of a program, um, practice, workflow, and then engage uh, potential end users in thinking through why would it fail? And then once they've articulated why it might fail, then you um, engage them to think through, well, how can we address these potential failures before we launch? Um, so this is the brain writing pre-mortem typically is done in a group setting. Um, for a variety of reasons, um, we needed to do it in an individual setting, um, and we conducted um, brain writing um, interviews, essentially, with both um, patients at, a, at the Federally Qualified Health Center, where we were testing out our, developing our testing program, and with um, providers who would be, you know, referring patients, or they themselves um, would go and use our testing services. So I'll show you more specifically. Um, so this is this was the initial workflow and um, uh, kind of map of our testing um, kind of order of operations. 
um, and what we did was we showed this to our brain writing um, interview participants. Um, we also had a video that we created um, to walk them through this. And um, so we walked them through what it would look like, what would happen when they arrived at the clinic, um, who would you know, approach them, what the consenting process would look like, about how long it would take to kind of go through the testing um, experience, when they would receive results, how they would receive results. So we walked them through this, and then we asked them um, a, just a couple of questions. So um, we asked them, you know, let's start with what you think is the most important reason for failure. And we, we did, um, we were um, faithful to the um, original brain writing um, methodology where you do use those words, failure. Um, we recognize that they're strong words, and um, we did receive a little bit of feedback um, and kind of um, concern from our community partners about using that word failure. Um, but it was actually really, um, it, we found it to be a pretty successful way of um, encouraging people to really be critical. Um, we, we needed the constructive criticism about how to um, prevent or refine the testing program. Um, so we asked them basically to walk us through um, different reasons why they thought the testing program might fail. Um, and so we're in the process now, um, and we, we would review those brain writing activities kind of in real time after we conducted them, um, because we, we did do the brain writing at a few time, time points before the, the testing program launched, um, I think within two months after we had launched it, and then I think at another maybe four or six months um, period, again, as a way to continue to refine and improve um, the testing program. Okay, moving on to our to my next um, community engagement method that I wanted to share. Um, this is we've um, published this recently in, in a Frontiers um, special issue, and um, it shows uh, what we think is a pragmatic way of analyzing and tracking resource needs and costs of community engagement. Um, we found that there was a, um, a real um, gap and how to really assess and show to funders and to kind of other um, kind of influential people to do meaningful community engagement. It takes um, significant and, and needed um, resources, fiscal, you know, human um, time. And so we wanted to be able to show that using um, our two COVID-19 um, projects as a case example. So um, in the paper, we, we map out the different activities, and then we used um, sort of a, a time-based activity log that our community partners um, filled out um, across the different phases of the, the two projects. So we broke it up into the startup phase, the early phase, and the maintenance phase. And you can see here some of the example activities um, that, we, um, that we tracked. So the startup phase had the fewest number of activities but these, I'll show you in just a moment, these were really um, quite time intensive. So this included identifying and inviting our advisory board members, creating access to technology, um, scheduling and coordinating the advisory board meetings, um, and establishing um, support systems for our, our advisory board members. And by that, I really need um, making it very clear and explicit who our um, community members could go to when they had questions about, you know, the scheduling of the meetings, how to access the meetings, um, the content of the meetings. Um, in the early phase and the maintenance phase, these were mostly the same set of activities. Um, and this mostly related to the actual kind of conduct of the um, advisory board meetings, the development and evaluation of the theory of change and the theory of change sessions. Um, and importantly, managing the honoraria um, provided to each of the CAD members. So what we found was um, that the startup period, um, so on the left-hand side, just to orient you, um, we have um, over the course of um, the first, I think it was maybe a year of both projects, um, we had our community partners um, track um, the number of hours they were spending on a weekly basis doing those various activities that I just showed you. 
And so um, in total, across both projects, the startup phase um, incurred the most number of hours, um, followed by um, the maintenance phase. The early phase had the fewest number of hours, um, but still, you know, a significant number. Um, so really, really important. One of the recommendations we talk about is it, it's really important to just um, in kind of budget for the time and resources needed, especially in that startup phase, um, to ensure that, um, you know, especially your community partners have what they need um, to be able to um, engage communities in a really thoughtful um, and meaningful way. And then on the right-hand side, this is a figure where it's broken up by the different community partner leads um, who, um, who facilitated all of those activities that we showed you. So there were two um, directors um, uh, from our Global Action Research Center. We also had a bilingual community outreach staff member who did a lot of that support system work I talked about, making sure that people had um, um, the kind of language materials that they needed. They, they could ask questions um, about you know, who, when, and why of, of the advisory board meetings. We also had a technology outreach staff member um, who really, his main focus was on making sure that people had the devices, the hotspots, um, the Zoom platform installed on their computers to be able to engage um, in our meetings. So this is, um, it was a simple um, Word document that we put together, just a table with all of our different activities. Um, and we, we came up together by we, I mean um, my um, uh, PI lead, Borsha Karabin, and our community partner leads um, at the Global Action Research Center. Um, we, we met and we continued to meet weekly. So we together came up with all of the activities we could think of that went into the community engagement aspects of the project. So that was on the, the left-hand side. And then um, we asked them to, um, to write in and record the number of hours they were spending on each of those activities. Um, if there were any other kind of specific costs or resources that we could add a dollar amount to, we did so in the, in the right-hand column. So this is, for us, this was a kind of a simple way, um, a kind of low-tech, non-fancy, but really helpful way to track um, number of hours and um, some costs associated with um, community engagement methods or activities. Okay, I think I'm gonna be able to end um, with a final um, community engagement evaluation method that we used. And this is um, described in um, an under review manuscript, also in Frontiers, um, where we describe a multi-method ethnographic approach to documenting, evaluating, and facilitating um, virtual community engaged implementation research in our two projects. So we, um, when we were starting these two projects and um, thinking about how to evaluate um, engagement, um, community engagement in our advisory board meetings in particular, um, we, we were struggling a bit to find really kind of comprehensive and thorough means of doing this. Um, and so we thought, well, since we're struggling to find some of these evaluation methods, one way um, that we, so we first went to our community partners and then we, um, we spoke with um, a medical anthropologist and a few other qualitative researchers. And we came, up, came upon this idea of doing um, ethnographic work to really evaluate kind of in real time what, what was happening in these advisory board meetings. And so we um, used a number of different um, observational forms um, that we trained um, a team of about 10 undergraduate and research interns on doing. And I'll show you some of the forms so you can see the different ways we were evaluating engagement. Um, I do wanna note that we called these innovation documentation forms. Um, and this was a recommendation from our community partner who um, expressed some concern about us um, describing that we were observing people, observing the community members. And um, so they thought, you know, since this is sort of a novel um, evaluation method, um, let's call it an innovation documentation experience. And so that's, um, it, which is kind of important language that we use throughout to describe what we were doing. 
So this is an example of one of the forms that we used and trained our research interns um, to assess. Um, it's, this, this one is simply kind of just dis describe what you're seeing in the advisory board. Um, who was in the, the main virtual room? Um, what kind of technology platform was being used? Um, what was the purpose or what was the agenda for the meeting? Um, did we get to all the agenda items discussed? time and start time and end time. So kind of just simple structuring of what the um, advisory board meeting looked like. We also had um, another documentation form that focused on um, actors. So who was contributing um, and what were they contributing? So we had, we had our um, research interns actually track the number of minutes each person spent speaking. Um, their primary language, and um, if they um, interrupted um, someone else, and for what purpose. So we really wanted to sort of understand kind of the back and forth um, um, communication experiences uh, that were happening with, uh, with, within and across the advisory board members. Um, and then this um, last form, um, it showed, it provided a little more information about the purpose of the communication. So was it to seek information, give information? Was it to express agreement with someone else's co um, comment? Um, was it to summarize? Um, was it sort of in closing? So we wanted to understand um, the, the, not only just the time spent talking, but what was the purpose of their um, uh, you know, uh, participation in the meetings. To complement um, the um, ethnographic evaluations, we also um, asked people, actually I'll skip this, skip this one. Um, we also asked um, everyone who was part of an advisory board meeting to complete um, a brief engagement survey developed, and I think I can show you in the next slide. It was developed by um, Dr. Goodman and colleagues from um, a paper published in 2019, a simple um, nine item measure that really um, asks you to rate sort of the, the quality and the quantity of different engagement um, experiences. So we asked each person um, to indicate what their role was within the advisory board. So even me as a research team member, I completed this survey as a non, um, as a research team non-board member. And then this was um, the survey. So um, it asks um, for individuals to rate how well um, the partners leading the research were doing each of the um, um, engagement activities, and then how often were they doing um, those activities. And so examples included um, the focus is on the needs important to the community. Um, all partners' ideas are treated with openness and respect. Um, these are, we had so much data, as you can imagine, um, for, for those of you who have done any sort of observational work, you know, <laughs> it takes a lot of time and you get a lot of data, very rich data, but a lot of data. And so um, we coded, um, to the extent that we could, um, many different ways, um, the types of information, um, purpose of um, kind of interactions, um, and different other metrics to evaluate engagement. So this is an example of the frequency of interaction types by the CAD members across our two projects. Um, so we, would, we were evaluating um, kind of time spent um, contributing um, based on uh, the, the CAD member types, so community partners, health clinic partners, um, our facilitators, the Global Action Research Center, um, and so forth. I think we were um, happy to see that um, in terms of who was um, sort of sharing and contributing and speaking a lot, our UCSD research team um, kind of said the least. So we, we, we comprised only about 1.7% of the meetings, which we were happy about. Um, but we were the target. Um, well, actually, maybe I think our community partners um, were sort of the target of most of the information, which was great because then we debriefed after each of these um, sessions and sort of made sense and, and thought through together um, next steps. This, um, I think maybe for time I'll skip this one. This is just another example of um, how we um, tried to uh, conduct sort of a thematic analysis 
of the content of what, what um, community members were sharing with one another. Mostly it was related to, um, again, we were developing a theory of change, so it mapped on quite well to the theory of change um, themes that we um, identified um, in the other paper that I showed you. So I'll, I'll close with um, a couple of lessons learned across both of these projects and using these methods. And then if I, if I have just one more minute, I'll share a little bit about our um, DNI Science Center and how you can kind of get involved if you're interested. Um, so first and forth, uh, foremost, um, engagement, it takes time and resources. And um, also importantly, cultural humility is critical. Um, I, I say this often, but I have learned much more from my community partners at Global Action Research Center and our community advisory board members um, than I think and hope that they've, they've learned um, from me. And I think that's made our work together all the better. Um, translations, interpretation, and transcription in diverse languages are critical and they can be high cost. I, I didn't mention, but um, should have, that for our Stop COVID-19 project, um, in addition to Spanish, we also conducted needs assessments, surveys, listening sessions um, in several other um, common languages of our immigrant refugee communities, including Karen, um, Kizigua, um, um, Somali, um, and a few other language, languages. Um, institutional infrastructure, especially at our universities, um, it doesn't always support community engagement. And so we often have to come up with creative solutions, especially when it comes to payment and payment of our community members. Um, so we have to think through how to be able to provide sub-awards to our community partners who could then um, purchase and then distribute honorarium and technology um, purchases. And then lastly, I didn't share about this, but um, we did train some of our community leaders to be research team members and help us collect data in some of those um, special languages um, that I mentioned earlier. So I think um, I'll skip this for just a moment because this might be part of our discussion. Um, but I wanted to just share a little bit about our UC San Diego DNI Science Center. We're really excited to, to welcome Dr. Rachel Shelton next um, Thursday in our monthly disc, uh, seminar series. We have a monthly, a monthly series um, every month where we invite and really engage in a rich discussion with um, implementation science researchers, practitioners, um, early career investigators, um, uh, people who are you know, thinking through K applications, and um, Dr. Shelton will be joining us next Thursday afternoon. Um, uh, our, our center is directed by a four-person team, um, Borsha Karabin, Laura, Lauren brooklyn um Greg Ahrens, and myself. And um, if you're interested in being a DISC member, it's, it's free. We welcome everyone to, to join. Um, I think this QR code hopefully still works. And I've just included some of our um, information here. Our website is disc.ucsd.edu. Um, and I think with that, I will stop, I think, nine minutes. Hopefully I did okay, Safana and Rachel. You did great, Nicole. Thank you so much. This was excellent. Um, I just, I wanted to say that, you know, I, what, what I thought was really an important point that you made, Nicole, was that it does take a lot of time and resources. And I really appreciated all of the different tools that you shared and even the tracker. I, you know, there's so much time that we spend with community partners and we all come to the table to have a discussion about what's important and to learn what matters the most, but we forget to, to think about how to articulate and sort of share the time that we spend because that's so important going forward. And it's important for our funders to know about the time and resources that are needed to be able to support this work for us to be able to continue to do it. So I really appreciate all of the tools like Miro and the different brain writing method and, and the tracker. I thought they were all excellent. So thank you. And that measure as well. I shared it in the chat, fantastic measure and short and sweet, which is great mm -hmm. for our community, um, our collaborators, you know, and. So I just, I appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you, Sapana. And I should mention too, with the, the, the Goodman measure, um, 
we supplemented it with a bit of a qualitative um, measure as well. So at the end of that survey, we added an open text box and um, in, just invited people to add any other reflections or comments they had from our advisory board meetings. And we actually learned a lot um, as an example um, some of our Spanish-speaking members requested and sort of brought to light that um, because there was often a delay in our interpretation, they didn't feel like they could contribute as much. And they, they gave us the idea that maybe you should start by inviting um, the Spanish-speaking community members to share first when we had questions. And so that was a really um, important um, kind of lesson and recommendation that we were able to implement. That's great. So I, I want to see if we have any other questions in the chat or at this point, I think folks can probably unmute themselves as well. So just want to invite folks to ask Dr. Static any questions. Oh, I see. Can you say again the name of the brainwriting exercise? Um, it, it's simply called premortem brainwriting. So before something um, fails, how can you think through um, how to address potential failures. So I, I'll just write it in the chat. I think it's Gil Martin um, is the name of the person. Oh, um, I see a question. I'm curious if you use specific resources or steps in developing the partnerships themselves? Um, great question. So we were initially um, linked with our primary community partners, the Global Action Research Center, um, through sort of a, a longer story, but they've been um, partnering um, with the university, with UC San Diego, through, this, through a Superfund Research Center um, program. I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with that. It's funded by the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences. And um, through that partnership, um, uh, Borshika, Rabin, and I got connected um, with them when this RADx up mechanism became available. And um, sort of our dean of health sciences thought, I know of some people doing various work that could probably address the um, mechanism or the, the, the priorities in this RADx up grant, brought us all together. We, and we clicked immediately because we were, you know, kind of talking in slightly different terms, but really our focus was on how do we engage communities meaningfully. They were doing it from more of a practice-based um, standpoint. Um, and so um, we kind of, we partnered through that um, grant and then they have so many established relationships um, with, kind of across San Diego, they were able to identify and recruit advisory board members for each of those projects. Um, so we really, um, we really learned and were able to um, kind of elevate their strong relationships with, within the community um, to bring together our, our advisory board members. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel? Yes, and I see there's another question too in the chat, but amazing job. I just wanted to thank you. This was so rich and detailed and comprehensive. I really appreciate it. Um, I wondered if you could speak a little bit about the this kind of tension between the rapid cycle piece and the community engagement piece and how you're kind of prioritizing the return of data and sharing of information with community partners with also kind of like the academic piece, because that's always so hard to do in terms of like the expectations for publishing it versus returning it. So anything you can share about that would be great. Great question. Um, and we, we've, what we've tried to do, I think, is ensure that we're meeting with our community partners and with the research team, not always together because schedules conflict, um, but weekly. And so um, Borshika and I sort of served as sort of a broker between our community partner meetings and the kind of field work um, I'm speaking mostly about our testing program um, because it was the largest and we had the most sort of active data collection um, happening. Um, so we would be able to meet with our community um, partners. We actually met with them every Monday um, 
and then our uh, kind of field team every Friday um, at 7 a.m., which we still still meet with, so bright and early, which was hard for our community partners. Um, so we would you know, try to facilitate um, sort of real-time questions and um, sharing of data within those weekly meetings. And then we would, with our community partners, come up with you know, specific questions that we wanted to bring to our advisory board um, members. We found it kind of most important and, and successful when we just didn't share data, but we shared data and then said, you know, can you help us understand why this might be? Or how could we, um, you know, this is a barrier that we've seen on site. Um, how can we address this based on your experiences? Um, the, the publications and so forth, um, you know, a, as we all try to do um, on our spare time, free time, um, those. Frankly, those, those sort of happened um, kind of naturally as we were just engaging in the work. And our community partners actually, um, they contributed a lot to the writing and reviewing of a lot of those manuscripts, which was a little bit new for them. Um, but they were so involved in you know, the, the methods that we were doing that um, it was sort of an extension of, of their work. Oh, and then I see the question about early outcomes from improved COVID testing participation. Um, well, I think from our federally qualified health centers perspective, um, and in part why we um, proposed and submitted this phase three application, they said to us, you know, we, we were doing this testing program at just one, one clinic. They said, can you scale this out and do this at all of our clinics? And, um, you know, we were excited about this. We needed, you know, um, more you know, resources to be able to do so. So in part, the healthcare center saying, we want more of this, how do we scale this, was kind of an, an early um, sign of success from our standpoint. And then numbers-wise, we were able, I think we tested over 10,000 community members, um, which I don't have comparison data to share with you, but I think um, th those numbers in and of themselves are pretty um, impressive for kind of a rapid response um, iterative, iterative design. Um, we also, um, and maybe I'll stop there because I see that we're out of time. I could talk about this for much longer. I'm so excited about it, but um, I'll maybe pass it back to you, Sapana and Rachel, to, to close this out. Thank you, Nicole. This was excellent. Um, just exemplary work doing community engaged partnered work. Um, really appreciate it. I, I definitely wanted to ask if you would be willing to share your slides because I think there was so much rich material and resources and tools that you shared with us today. Um, so we could share it with a, with a group that's come. For the, okay, great. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. And also, I think you're sharing your um, email address as well. So if folks have questions, please feel free to reach out. And thank you so much for, for joining us today. And Nicole, thank you for this excellent presentation. Thank you so much, everyone. It was lovely to see you all. Thank you. Take thank care, you. everyone.